So let's look in Romans chapter 6. And the message today I've just entitled, The Glory of God. Notice Romans 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now I have a confession to make today and that confession is simply this. The message that I'm going to bring to you today was developed out of my own curiosity. I was reading through the book of Romans, and I came to Romans chapter 6, and I looked at verse 4, and I read this verse, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So I read that verse, and then I reread that verse, and then I reread it again. And then I asked myself this question. Why are we specifically told that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father? And then I had to ask myself this question. What is implied and what does the Bible mean when it says that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father? And evidently it applies to us. Because he says, even so, we should also walk in newness of life. So my next question was this. I know that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father. That's what the Bible says. I wanted to know what the glory of the Father was and how that applied to my life and how it will apply to your life and how it will make us walk more holily and more obediently. So if verse 4 tells us that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father... And the conclusion is, therefore, we should walk in newness of life. We must grasp and understand what that means at all costs. Now, when we think of the glory of God, we can think of a multitude of scriptures that refer to the glory of God. In fact, some of those scriptures are exceedingly common. For instance, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. If you can't quote it, you could almost quote it. For the Bible says, whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now think about that. If you're to do all to the glory of God, what really does that mean? And how about this one? Romans 15 and verse 7. There we are commanded, Wherefore, receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Receive ye one another. Now, I've preached on this in years and years past, but there is a biblical reception that is to be given to the saints of God. And it's to be done in a biblical way. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And then you can come to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, where the Bible says, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, here are just three scriptures that refer to the glory of God, and it also refers to an impact upon our lives. So my question is, if Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, how does that make us that we must walk, therefore, in newness of life? Now, let me give you a quote from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Listen to what Jeremiah wrote. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now God says if you're going to glory in anything, you might ought to glory in this, that you know me and that you understand me. Wow. Therefore, when the Bible says in Romans 6 and verse 4, that like as Christ was raised from the dead 
by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. There is something there that we must understand concerning the glory of God. Let me give you a quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, he said this, The proper study of the Christian is the Godhead. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can engage the attention of the child of God, is the name, nature, and the person, the doings, and the existence of the great and mighty God, which he calls Father. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all of our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can comprehend and grapple with, and in them we feel a kind of self-content and self-confidence, and we go our way with the thought, Behold, I am wise. But when we come to this master science, that is the knowledge of God, finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth, Amid that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought, I am but yesterday and know nothing. Isn't that amazing? And that's true. When you begin to study the doctrine of God, and you begin to see how great, how majestic, and how glorious He is, And how utterly it is impossible for you and I to comprehend God in His fullness. We have to say, I am nothing. Do you realize the very first catechetical question that is asked, usually in any catechetical instruction, especially in the Westminster, Philadelphia Confession, is this. What is the chief end of man? You remember the answer? The chief end of man is to glorify God And to enjoy Him forever. When we talk about our chief end is to glorify God, we've got to remember what Scripture says. Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. In other words, we have not lived up to that which God has commanded us. We have not glorified Him the way that we should. And even as Christians today, we still do not glorify Him the way that we should. But fallen man, natural man, unsaved man, according to Romans 8 verses 6 and 8, is an enmity against God, that is, he hates God, and he's certainly not interested in glorifying God. But I'm asking the question based upon Romans 6 and verse 4. What does it mean when the Bible says that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father? And how does that apply to us? When you talk about the glory of God, the very first thing that you should think about is God's glory is revealed in His creation. You remember that passage in Psalm 19 where the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. It is true that God's glory may be seen in His creation. That is God's external glory, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But Revelation 4 and verse 11 declares this. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were and are created. We have to acknowledge that everything that exists, exists for God's honor and God's glory. Everything that God does in creation, in providence, and in redemption is ultimately for His own honor and glory. Since you're in the book of Romans, look very quickly at Romans 11 and verse 36. Here's a verse that would sum up this. Romans 11 and verse 36. Scripture says, For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things... To whom be glory forever. Amen. Now look at that. Verse 36. For of him that is originally and through him that is providentially and to him that is ultimately are all things to whom be glory forever. So everything that is done in creation, 
in providence and in redemption is done for God's honor and glory. Now, when we think of God's glory, we normally think of that external glory which is revealed in creation. But may I point out the fact that God has a glory that is above creation. In fact, David speaks about that glory in Psalm 8 in verse 1. Let me just quote it. I've got a lot of other scriptures I want you to look at in just a moment. But in Psalm 8 in verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Now it is true the external glory of God is seen in creation, but God has a glory that he has set above the heavens. In Psalm 57, verse 5 and verse 11, the scripture says, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, let thy glory be above all the earth. So God has a glory that is revealed in the earth, and God has a glory that is above the earth. God's glory is the goal of all of his plans for mankind. The glory of God is that which you and I see in creation, providence, and redemption. And in every one of these areas, God is concerned with his glory. In fact, all that God orchestrates, all that God wills, all that God determines, all that God purposes, all that God causes to occur in And through his creation in this life is for his honor and glory. Now, when we talk about God's glory, let me just say, first of all, it is impossible to define God's glory. I can tell you the Hebrew word for glory is kabod. I can tell you the Greek word for glory is taksa. And I can tell you what kabod and doxod mean. That is how they're translated. But I cannot define God's glory. I can define the words which speak of his glory. But I cannot define his glory. Why? Because to define God is to limit God. And if you try to define God's glory, you're trying to limit God's glory, which is absolutely and totally impossible. God's glory is synonymous with his magnificence, his splendor, his beauty, his perfection. God's glory speaks of God's dignity, his honor, his wisdom, his majesty, and his unquestionable justice in all of his dealings and his creation. Everything that is and everything that exists, exists for God's honor and glory. And I might point out, folks, all the credit... That everything that we are and everything that we have belongs to God alone. Everything that you have, God gave you. Your family, your friends, your finances, your children, your breath, your life, your health. Everything that you have, God gave you. And if you don't think that He gave you that, you just try to breathe without Him. And you'll find out that you don't exist. Now, God has an external glory. And I'm going to show you in just a moment, God also has an essential glory. But when I thought about all these passages that dealt with God's glory, I thought, how does that apply to Romans 6 and verse 4? When the Bible specifically tells us that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead by the glory of the Father. And therefore, we should walk in newness of life. So I thought, how do I explain this? How do I even learn what that means? And then I came to the realization that everything must be interpreted within the analogy of faith. That is... Whatever the Bible is teaching in Romans 6 and verse 4, it is also taught in other passages of the Bible as well. So there's a passage in the Old Testament that came to my mind, and I want you to turn there, please, to Exodus chapter 33. Whole Romans 6, we're coming back there. But turn back to Exodus chapter 33. In this passage... 
Moses has been pleading with God for his assurance that God would be with him as he undertook to lead the people. In Exodus 33, beginning there with verse 17, in fact, let's read verse 16, Moses, uh, verse 15, and he said unto him, that is Moses speaking to God, he said, if thy, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Lord, if you're not going to be with me, I don't want to go. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Now watch verse 17. So now Moses is pleading for God's presence to go with them. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Moses, you ask for my presence. I'm going to make sure that I go with you. Now look what Moses says in verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now let's stop there just for a moment. I want you to note that Moses did not ask to know the will of God. He did not ask to see the mighty power of God. He did not ask to see the greatness of God. Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Uh, show me thy glory. Glory. Do you realize if you and I just studied the rest of our life, the glory of God in creation, the glory of God in providence, and the glory of God in redemption, we could never in our lifetimes exhaust those three subjects. We could never do it. But when you stop and think that God has a glory that is above the earth, that is, God has an in, internal and inherent glory, that glory which is known as His essential glory, we could never fathom that glory. Why? Because one would have to be God in order to understand the glory of God. But yet Moses says... Show me thy glory. Now I'm going to come back to this passage in just a moment. But look in Exodus chapter 34. And get ready to read there just for a moment. Before I read that passage, let me just summarize what God has said. Moses says, show me thy glory. God says, here's what I'll do. I'll make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim that I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Now the first thing I want you to understand is this. What God showed Moses were his attributes. The attributes of God are manifestations of God's glory. Now, God is not through, for in Exodus 34, look at verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Wow. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, watch now, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. Now I want you to understand there are two key attributes that are pointed out in Exodus 34. And that is God's grace and God's justice. God is infinitely just and God is sovereignly gracious. Now, I want to give you a quote by Charles Haddon Spurgeon again. Three paragraphs. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon was preaching 
from Exodus 33, where Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And here's what Spurgeon says. Listen carefully. We find that Moses saw no similitude, no form passed before him. He had an audience. He had a vision. But it was an audience from behind a covering and a vision, not of a person, but an attribute. Behold in the scene. There stands Moses about to be honored with visions of God. The Lord is about to answer thee, O Moses, God is come. Dost thou not tremble? Do not thy knees knock together? Are not thy bones loosened? Are not thy sinews broken? Canst thou bear the thought of God coming to thee? Oh, I can picture Moses as he stood in the cleft of the rock with the hand of God before his eyes. And I can see him look as man never looked before, confident in faith, yet more than confounded at himself that he could have asked such a petition. Now, what attribute is God about to show Moses? His petition is, show me thy glory. Will he show him his justice? Will he show him his holiness? Will he show him his wrath? Will he show him his power? Will he break yon cedar and show him he is almighty? Will he render yon mountain and show him that he can be angry? Will he bring his sins to remembrance and show him that he is omniscient? No. Hear the still, small voice. I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Ah, the goodness of God, that is God's glory. God's greatest glory is that he is good. The brightest gem in the crown of God is His goodness. I will make all my goodness pass before thee. There is a panorama such as time would not be long enough for you to see. God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. But there was something more. No one attribute of God sets God out to perfection. There must always be another. He said, I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. There is another attribute of God. There is His sovereignty. Now listen, God's goodness without His sovereignty does not completely set forth His nature. Now I want you to think about what Spurgeon has said. And I want you to think about what Scripture has pointed out. When Moses said, show me thy glory, God said, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before thee. And then I'm going to tell you, I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I'll be merciful to whom I will be merciful. Now, I want to ask you a question. How does all this fit in with Romans 6 and verse 4? I want you to turn back there. I'm going to develop this for you, but I want you to think about this. Look at Romans 6 and verse 4. Paul writes, Therefore we we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. You know what some commentators do? Some commentators will take this phrase, the glory of God, And just make it synonymous or equal to God's power. For instance, Matthew Poole, who is normally a great commentator, he says this. By the glory of the Father, in other words, by the power of the Father, which is called His glorious power. God has said elsewhere to have raised Him by His power. And He said to live by the power of God. And so what Matthew Poole and some of the others say, well, all the glory of God is just simply the power of God. Well, certainly the power of God has to be included in God's glory because that is one of God's attributes. But you have to ask this question. If you limit verse 4, that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, if you limit that to the power of God, is that all there is to God's glory? And the answer is obviously no. Now, let me ask some questions. I'm asking these for a reason. I know that most of you in here can answer these questions, okay? Here are here they are. I'm just setting you up so I can explain Romans 6 and verse 4. Here's my first question. Was God obligated to create the world? 
No. He was not. What did the Bible say in Romans, uh, Revelation 4 and verse 11? We read it earlier. For thy own pleasure they were created. God was not obligated to create the world. I had a preacher ask me just recently, why did God create the world? And my response was, for his own honor and glory. According to Revelation 4 and verse 11, he said, that's exactly what I believe. But he said, you know, I heard another preacher say the reason God created the world was because he was lonely. I said, do you realize that speaks of deficiency in God? If God's lonely, he's not fulfilled and content in and of himself. That's a denial of the Godhood of God. No. Was God obligated to create the world? No, he was not. Well, let me ask you another question. After God created the world, was he obligated to provide for everyone and everything in the world? No. Well, after man sinned and rebelled against God, was God obligated to provide salvation? No. Is God right now obligated to save sinners? No. Do you realize, I could ask this question, would God be absolutely just if he damned every sinner? And the answer is yes. He would be. Now, let me just point out the fact, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, obligation, look back in your Bibles to Romans 11, since you're there, in verses 33 through 35. Just to show you that it is impossible... To bring God into obligation to anyone at any time. Look at Romans 11, beginning there at verse 33. Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Now watch this. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? No one. Who hath been his counselor? No one. Who has first given to God anything? No one. You say, but I tithe and I give gifts. Well, the only reason you can tithe and give gifts is because God first gave to you. But I love him. The only reason you love him is because he first loved you. You can't do anything first to God. Therefore, you cannot bring God into obligation. Do you realize the only thing that God owes sinners is justice? And I got news for you. You don't want that. You want mercy. Now, since we understand that God was not obligated to create, and God was not obligated to provide, and God was, God was not obligated to send salvation, and God's not obligated to save anybody... Let's ask a question. Go back to Romans 6 and look at verse 4. Romans 6 verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now wait a minute, here's my question. Since God was not obligated to provide salvation, and since God is not obligated to save sinners, why did he send Jesus Christ? Why did he set forth Christ to be our propitiation? Why does he forgive our sins? Why did he provide such a great and glorious salvation in Jesus Christ? Why does God justify the ungodly? And the answer comes back, Simply because of the goodness of God in His grace. Let me give you the scripture. You don't have to turn there. I'll quote them. Here's Romans 3 and verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption of Christ Jesus. Note the emphasis on freely. Being justified freely. We didn't earn it. We didn't merit it. We didn't deserve it. God freely, graciously, out of the goodness of His heart, sent redemption in Jesus Christ. 
Romans 5 verses 20 and 21 tells us where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. God in His goodness, God in His abundant grace, has sent Christ. He sent Christ to be our substitute. He set forth Christ as a propitiation for our sins. And it was only as Jesus Christ took our place, suffered our lawful wrath, and suffered the penalty of the broken law for us, that God was enabled then to be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus Christ according to Romans 3 and verse 26. Now let me show you something. You're in the book of Romans. Turn back to Romans chapter 2. Let me show you what Paul charges the ungodly with. Those who refuse the great salvation that God has provided in Jesus Christ. I want you to note the words that the Apostle Paul uses. Now watch. Romans chapter 2, verse 3. And thinkest thou this, old man, that thou that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Now look what they're doing. Verse 4, or despisest thou the riches of his what? Goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up wrath unto thyself, wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now look what Paul does. Paul says, when you are refusing the salvation that God has provided, you are misusing and abusing the goodness of God in sending Jesus Christ. Now, go back to Romans 6 and verse 4. I'm hopefully going to start tying this together for you. I want you to think with me now. This is one of those messages you have to think. I don't have three points in a poem. This whole message is just explaining one simple phrase. Okay? Look in Romans 6 and verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now, watch this. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, even so we should walk in newness of life. How was he raised up? By the glory of the Father. Now, we see the glory of the Father according to Scripture in two specific areas. What did God show Moses? Moses said, I beseech thee, show me, my, show me thy glory. And God said, Moses, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make all my goodness to pass before you. And then I'm going to proclaim that I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I'll be merciful to whom I'll be merciful. First of all, I want you to see the goodness of God in sending Christ as our salvation. Just think about this. The goodness of God in sending Christ. What did the Bible say? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead. So Christ is involved. So the first thing we should see is the goodness of God in sending Christ for our salvation. Let me just quote some scriptures. John 3 and verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Did you hear that? For God sent not His Son to condemn, but to save. How about this one, Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. How about this one? Galatians 4 and verse 4. But in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. How about this one in 1 John 4 and verse 10? Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Now watch. There is the goodness of God in sending Christ for our salvation. What did God show Moses? First, his goodness. Secondly, his sovereignty. I want you to know that God sovereignly raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, think about this. God did not raise any of the Old Testament prophets from the dead like he did Christ. He did not raise any of the 
New Testament apostles or prophets from the dead like he did Christ. No, God sovereignly chose Christ. I'll explain that just a little bit later. He sovereignly chose Christ and he sovereignly raised him from the dead. The resurrection of Christ is attributed to the Father over and over in the scriptures. Let me just quote a few. Acts 3 and verse 15. Here's what Peter says. And kill the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead where we're his witnesses. How about this one, Acts 4 and verse 10. Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. Acts 13 and verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. Acts 17 verse 31, because he did appoint a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he, God the Father, hath raised him from the dead. How about Romans 10 verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Ephesians 1 verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And finally, Hebrews 13 verse 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now, I want you to note, we've seen the goodness of God in sending Christ and the sovereignty of God in raising Christ from the dead. Now, I want you to look in Romans 6 and verse 4. Here are two very important phrases. I'm going to explain one of them right now. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as... You see those two words? That like, as. is from the Greek word hosper, which means like as, or even as, or just as. Now look at that. Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as, or just like, Christ was raised from the dead... Just like God graciously and sovereignly worked in his life, even so he did in our lives. Now let me tell you something that you might not be aware of. Did you know that God the Father chose God the Son to be the mediator? You say, what? Well, sure, I understand that. But there's a specific scripture that tells you that. Look in your Bibles to Isaiah. Whole Romans 6, we're coming right back. But look in Isaiah chapter 42, if you would, and verse 1. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. I want you to see how the Bible speaks about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 42, verse 1. God says concerning Christ, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. This is a messianic prophecy. And the Bible is telling us that Jesus Christ is God's elect. There was a mediatorial election by God the Father. And God the Father chose Jesus Christ to be the mediator. Wow. Now, turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Just like Christ was chosen to be the God-man, to be the mediator, God also chose us unto salvation. Look in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. But we're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now, wait a minute. Who chose us to salvation? God did. There's a theological election. God 
chose us, or a soteriological election, God actually chose us to salvation. And if you want to read Ephesians 1 and verse 4, or just let me quote it, here's what the scripture says. According as he had chosen us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, let me show you. The Bible says in Romans 6 and verse 4, like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Just like, just as, just as Jesus Christ was chosen by God to be the mediator, so God chose us to salvation in Jesus Christ. Now let me put this together for you. Look in your Bibles to John chapter 5. There's still another little phrase in Romans 6 and verse 4 that I have to explain. But look in John 5, beginning there in verse 1. And I don't have to read much of this for you to get the idea. John 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down in a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in and was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying, knew now that he'd been a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise up, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath day. Now, I want to ask you some questions. How many people were at this pool? A great multitude. How many were sick? All of them. Sick, halt, lame, impotent, blind. What does the Bible say Jesus Christ did? Jesus Christ went in the midst of all of these sick, lame, blind, impotent people, found one man. And said, will thou be made whole? Man said, sir, I don't have anybody to help me. While I'm trying to get to the pool, somebody else steps in and then it's too late for me. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. Here's my question. Why did Jesus Christ walk in the midst of all of those sick, blind, impotent, lame people and heal one man? That's all. Didn't heal anybody else. Here's my question. How many of those people needed healing? All of them. How many of them could have our Lord healed had he desired? All of them. This man that he did heal, did he recognize who Christ was? No. Did he cry out for help? No. Jesus came to him. Jesus approached him. And when he said, will thou be made whole, he still didn't know who Christ was. And Christ said, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now my question is, why did Jesus Christ walk in the midst of a multitude of sick, blind, halt, impotent, and lame people and heal one man? Here's why. Look in John 5. And verse 21, skipping on down, here's what our Lord says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, help me out now, even so the Son quickeneth, what's that next phrase? Whom he will. Let's find out why. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. Now let me ask these two questions. Why does the Son... Quicken whom he will. And why has all judgment been committed to the Son? Here's why. That all men should honor the Son even as equal to as they honor the Father. What's that telling you? Jesus Christ is God. 
What is the one attribute that sets God apart from everyone else? And the answer is, it is His sovereignty. Let me ask that again. I want, you, I want this to think, sink in. What is the one attribute that sets God apart from everyone else? It is His sovereignty. Are you listening? God does as He pleases only as He pleases, and always as He pleases. He's the only one that can do that. The Bible said in Psalm 115, verse 3, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased. Now, why did Jesus Christ walk in the midst of all those sick people and heal that one man? He said, so that everybody will know that I'm God. That I do as I please. What did... God tell Moses, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful. I'm God. I can do as I please. I can be gracious to whom I please. I am God. Now, let me show you. Since you're in the book of John, turn right over to John chapter 11. Let me show you an illustration of what I'm talking about. John chapter 11. Everybody knows the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They were dear friends of our Lord. And Lazarus, you know, died. And look, if you would, in John 11 verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that same Mary that anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus is sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou loveth is sick. Jesus heard that. When Jesus heard that, look what he said. This sickness is not unto death. But why? But for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now this sickness is not unto death. But unto the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, let me ask you, what happened to Lazarus? He died. How can our Lord say then, this sickness is not in death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of Man might be glorified thereby? How could he say that? He died. Well, skip down if you would please. Verse 6. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still at the same place. Then after that, he said to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. And his disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. Now, skip down, if you would, to verse 11. These things said he, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now wait a minute. Am I confused? Our Lord said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now he says, Lazarus is dead. Is there a contradiction? Oh, no. Because, you see, when our Lord went there, Martha first went out to meet our Lord. And uh, let's skip down to verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Now watch this. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection of the light. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which shall come into the world. Now, wait a minute. Let me show you something. <laughs> Martha said, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Jesus said, listen, Martha, the resurrection just walked into town. You don't have to worry about Lazarus. Believe you this? 
Oh, she said, Lord, I believe that you're the son of God. Well, now our Lord says, Martha, you need to believe exactly what I'm telling you. Now, skip down, if you would, please. Uh, look at verse 28. I, I, after our Lord silences Martha, when she had said, so said, she went away and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The Master has come and calleth for thee. So uh, Martha said, Hmm, this might be a little more than I can handle. So she sends Mary out there. And of course, Mary follows the same thing. So skip down, if you would, please. Verse 34. And he said, Christ said to them, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone laid upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, to whom he had spoken earlier, the sister of him that was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he's been dead four days. Now watch this. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see what? The glory of God. And when they took away the stone, help me out now. What did Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God incarnate, what did he do? He said, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? He that was bound with the grave clothes came forth. I want you to note, Jesus Christ did not call all of the dead forth. He singled out Lazarus. He will be gracious to whom he will be gracious. He will be merciful to whom he will be merciful. And he sovereignly singled out Lazarus to be raised from the dead. Now, I want you to go back Romans 6, and look at verse 4. I want you to remember this. Moses said, God, show me thy glory. And he made all his goodness pass before Moses. And then he said, I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll be merciful to whom I'll be merciful. So God's goodness and God's sovereignty. We've seen it in John 5. We've seen it in John 11. Now look in Romans 6 and verse 4. Here it is. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, I told you about the little phrase, like as. When you come down to this Second phrase, even so, it is the Greek word hutos, which means even so, likewise, or in like manner. Look at it like this. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that just like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, or just like, or likewise, we also should walk in newness of life. Wait a minute. What did God the Son do in John chapter 5? He walked in the midst of that multitude, singled out one man, and healed him. What did He do in John 11? He singled out one man, Lazarus, and raised him from the dead. Did you remember what our Lord said in John 10 and verse 3? He calleth His own sheep by name. Do you remember that? How about John 10 verse 27? Christ said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. What is Paul telling us in Romans 6 and verse 4? Here's what he's telling us. He's saying, just like God who chose Jesus Christ and then sovereignly spoke the word and raised him from the dead, just like that God chose us in Christ and sovereignly spoke the word and gave us regeneration and conversion and faith to believe in him, just like he saved Christ by raising him from the dead, he saved us by raising us spiritually from the dead in like manner. Now look in verse 5. After he says, even so, we should walk in newness of life. Then he says in verse 5, explaining further, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
Oh, dear friend, let me ask you, what does the Bible say? When Christ was raised from the dead, he was raised from the dead, that he dieth no more. Are we going to die? No. Our bodies may drop off, but we're not going to ever, ever die. Because just like God raised him from the dead, even as we also are raised in newness of life. And just like Christ was raised from the dead to live unto the Father, why did He raise us from the dead that we might live unto the Father just as Christ did? Do you see the motive for walking in newness of life? We understand that God did not have to save us. God did not have to send Christ. God did not have to give redemption. And yet in the goodness and the grace of God, He sent redemption. And then in His sovereignty, He singled us out and saved us. When we deserve nothing but justice and damnation. <laughs> wow. You're talking about a motive to walk in newness of life. Let me just read 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 11. Paul is praying for the Thessalonians and he says this, Wherefore also we pray for you always that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. What was it that saved those Thessalonians? The goodness of God and the faith of God and the power of of the Holy Ghost. Now listen to this one. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, the Bible says that God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The glory of the Father that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same glory that raised us from the dead. Therefore, we're to walk in newness of life. Now, let me make just a couple of applications and we'll close. Here's the question. How then do we glorify God? Well, here's the answer. We glorify God by walking in newness of life. According to the same goodness and the same power that was shown to Christ. It is in us. It was exercised in us. And it is now our motive for godly obedience and holy living. The same God that chose Christ chose us. The same God that raised Christ from the dead raised us from the dead as well. Now, here's my second application. The next time we quote 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God, you've got to remember this. We're obligated to do that. Because God chose us and God saved us by Jesus Christ. And the reason that he saved us was that we might live unto him. That we might walk in newness of life. Do you realize we owe God a double debt? We're not only his creatures by virtue of creation. We're his by virtue of redemption. He bought us. That's why the scripture says you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God, therefore, in your body and your spirit, which are His. He owns us. And we're doubly obligated to honor Him. But when you stop and think, the same God and the same power and the same goodness and the same grace that raised Christ from the dead and gave him newness of life. It's that same God, that same goodness, that same grace, that same power that will enable us to be obedient and to walk in newness of life. Why does the scripture say, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Hmm? You remember he said in Zechariah 4 and verse 6, not by might nor power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Salvation from A to Z, or if you're in the Greek, from Alpha to Omega, is of God. He's the first and the last, and everything in between too. Without him, we're nothing. We can do nothing. But with Him, 
as the Apostle Paul says, we can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. And can you imagine the glory of the Father just like when He raised Christ from the dead. So He raised us by the same power. Wow. No wonder we should walk in newness of life. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray to Thee today that You would give us grace and mercy and holiness. Lord, help us to see there's godly motives for obedience. And we have to acknowledge and confess that salvation is of the Lord. Lord, everything is of Thee. The only thing we provided was the sinner. And Lord, I just give Thee the praise and the honor today. And I'm thankful that as You chose Christ to be our mediator... You chose us in Him. And just as You sovereignly raised Him from the dead, You sovereignly raised us to newness of life in Jesus Christ. And therefore we're obligated, Lord, to worship Thee and to honor Thee and to be obedient. May we be like Him and bring our lives into conformity to Your Word. Give us grace, Lord, to serve Thee acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In thy name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen.